Hello, shiver seekers. Are you ready to follow us into the clandestine unknown? I'm Cynthia. And I am Stephanie. You have found the dark oak. Cynthia's making a provocative gesture. <laughs> Is that what that was? I don't know. There was hip thrusting. You think <laughs> what? I was, oh, literally, I was literally pumping my arm. Okay, I see what you're saying. Thank you from the eye of the beholder. But do you see what like, I think I'm doing? So I think I'm pumping okay, my arm. Okay, can you stop doing it while looking at me? Oh my gosh. Guys, <laughs> we are in a silly, silly mood. I think I may have had too much coffee. I'm about to talk one about my favorite cases. We're, yeah, we're feeling it today. We are. Okay. Well, we want you to feel it with us. That's right. So we're going to jump into, again, one of my favorite cases. It is, it blows my mind every time that I hear about it, read about it, think about it. And it's actually been like a topic around our house because my husband is totally into this case too. So he's really into spy novels, um, especially historical spy novels. He and I are both into like World War II history. And this has, it has all the things. Like it literally could be its own novel. Okay. Yeah. Love it. So today we're going to talk about the Somerton Man. Okay. All right. So we're going to start on the evening of November 30th, 1948, when a number of people noticed a man propped up against a concrete seawall on Somerton Beach in Adelaide, Australia. Okay. Okay. His legs were outstretched and his feet were serenely crossed. So if you're out walking on the beach, the guy's just kind of leaning against a seawall, you know, the little, the wall to, you know, keep the surf yeah, off, he's off relaxing. the dunes. Exactly. He's just relaxing, Chilling. right? Something about him was odd, though. For one, he wore a full suit, including polished shoes. Okay. Interesting beach attire. Interesting beach attire. And... Now, remember our, for those of our American listeners, think about it, the seasons are flipped. So in Australia, even though this takes place in November, December, this is for them, the heat of the summer. Oh, okay. So this isn't like a chilly night. Okay. This is like the middle of summer. When you would go to the beach. When you would go to the beach, not wearing a complete suit with polished shoes. All right. So this is a balmy evening on the beach. So strange. One couple remembers him raising his arm as if he was, like, trying to drunken, drunkenly light a cigarette. And so they're like, oh, okay, well, that guy's had a few pops, right? Okay. Like, so uh-huh. he just got, you know, drunk, yeah. and now he's, like, sitting at the beach. <laughs> this and suit. his, you know, okay. stranger things have happened. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> what a place to end up after a nice night out. It's not. Or day. Would it be terrible? Yeah, Exactly. Okay. And another couple recalls him kind of, again, drunkenly, like kind of, you know, not very fluidly trying to swat mosquitoes away from his face. Okay. Or seeing mosquitoes swarm around his face. One recalls there was mosquitoes around him, but he wasn't swatting them away. So we were thinking, they were thinking too, like, okay, maybe he's just too drunk to even like shoo the bugs away. Yeah. He's passed out. Yeah. But nobody really thought anything outside of, wow, that's kind of weird. Let's keep moving. (laughs) You know? Sure. While it was thought that he was sitting there drunk on the beach. Unfortunately, what they were witnessing is this man's slow death. Oh. The next morning, very early in the morning, a pair of teenage amateur jockeys on horseback who were ex- who were exercising their boss's horses. So he had these like amazing like race horses. And uh-huh. it was their job to kind of run up and down the beach to keep them in shape. Okay. They noticed this body okay. at 6.30 a.m. He was in the same position and he was definitely dead. Okay. Okay. So immediately 
they because they went over and they're like, let's check on this dude. And one of them kind of lift up his leg and it was clearly like he was gone. So they rushed back to the stables and they called the police. An initial inspection of the Somerton man, as he came to be called, resulted in strange findings. There was no money, no <laughs> wallet, no identification of any kind on him. Hmm. And all of the labels had been removed from his clothing. Like brands labels? Yes. Okay. Any identifying marks had either been cut out or removed in some way. Interesting. So when I say no identification, I literally mean no identification. You couldn't even figure out what clothes he was wearing. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Very interesting. Now, the body was moved to the Royal Adelaide Hospital and then to the city morgue to allow time for further investigation. Because of the state of the man's body, investigators believed that they would soon receive a missing persons report. Sure. Because, again, he was well-dressed. Right. right. He He's, seemed to have, have his act together. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, yeah, okay, some people thought he was drunk. And again, at that point, they haven't even figured out a cause of death. And because... You know, they didn't see anything immediately. They were like, okay, maybe it's a heart attack or something. But again, he's in good shape. So he was wearing a suit, a button-down shirt, a tie, polished leather shoes. Also, he was cleanly shaven. And his fingernails and toenails were neatly trimmed with no dirt around them. Hmm. So this isn't, you know, a homeless person or right, a, yeah. a, um, not a vagrant. What's the word I'm looking for? A uh, nomad. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, this is right. someone that clearly has lived somewhere. Also, his hands and feet were taken care of with no signs of calluses or wear. So this wasn't a laborer. Okay. Right? An initial inspection of the body revealed no obvious cause of death. Like I said, he was just there and he was dead. There was no evidence of stabbing, a shooting, or obvious injury. It appeared he had just died in his sleep. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the start of a kind of mystery. Yeah. Here. Like on a suit, in a suit, on the beach, just dies right and no missing persons reports that match him at all found in the summerton man's pockets were a pack of army club cigarettes but the pack contained a different brand of cigarettes that's interesting it's weird right? i cannot think of any reason why you would do that yeah and this is like a disposable pack of, of cigarettes. right so this, it's not like a this nice... is like a cardboard pack of it's not like a nice yeah like tin right or something like that that you would want to like transfer cigarettes so an army pack, an army club pack of cigarettes, but they contain a different brand of cigarette. A box of Bryant and May matches, a pack of juicy fruit gum, one American metal comb. And again, remember, he's in Australia. Okay. So it was notable that it was American. Okay. A plastic comb, a handkerchief, and an unused train ticket, and a used bus ticket. Okay. All right. Clearly, out of all of those, they're like, let's track down these tickets mm -hmm. and see if we can figure out his whereabouts. So that's exactly what they did. They went to the Adelaide, uh, basically the, the transportation station, and they were like, let's figure out if we can track his movements the day before his death. So it appeared he had arrived in Adelaide that morning. Um, so the morning that people saw him on the beach. Okay. That morning. And he was either traveling from Melbourne, Sydney, or Port Augusta. He then purchased a train ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach, but for whatever reason, he never boarded that train, but instead purchased a bus ticket and caught the city bus to Somerton Beach. All right. Okay. Okay. While at the Adelaide railway station, investigators checked the cloakroom to find out if there was any unclaimed luggage. Oh, that's smart. It was smart. And... It, it paid off. Oh, sure enough. Okay. Because after a quick check, it was revealed that a briefcase had been checked in, but never checked out of the cloakroom on the same day the Samaritan man arrived and departed. Okay. Yeah. So inside the luggage, investigators found a red men's dressing gown, a size seven red felt pair of slippers, four pairs of underpants, pajamas, shaving items, a light brown pair of trousers, which was the same size size worn by the Summerton man. Okay. Interestingly, though, these trousers had sand in the cuffs. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, kind of weird, right? Yeah. An electrician's screwdriver, a table knife cut down into a short, sharp 
instrument, a pair of scissors with sharpened points, a small square of zinc thought to have been used as the protective shield for the knife and the scissors, and a stenciling brush, the same ones used by third officers on merchant ships for stenciling cargo. What an interesting array of <laughs> items. Yeah, the the kind of like, in my opinion, at least like makeshift weapons is kind of weird. Yeah, yeah. Also, I didn't see this written anywhere, but there were no socks. Okay. Awesome. Does that strike you as odd? It Maybe does... he was just a poor packer. I don't well, know. Well, because he's got a dressing gown. Now that's like a robe, right? A, yes. And so yeah. he's got a robe and slippers, which to yeah. me, are not things you necessarily have to have when right. traveling. Like, right. those are extra. Those are kind of fancy amenities. Yeah, you know? it's like, I'm going to be lounging. Right. Um, but he's yeah, got shaving stuff. Yeah, he's got his pajamas. He's got underwear, shaving stuff. But no socks. That's interesting. But no socks. Yeah. Especially because, I mean, again, he was found wearing these, like, polished shoes. Right. Was he wearing socks? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to get no to what extra. he was actually wearing, but okay. he didn't have any extra socks. But that he, is interesting. Again, maybe he was just a poor packer. Or an extra shirt. He didn't have an extra shirt either. No, that's true. That's true. Which to me, like if I only could bring one pair of pants or one shirt, and I would like, to me, shirts get dirtier than pants. That's true. A lot of So like I area. would pack yeah. extra shirts over an extra pair of pants, yeah, which but, he did not. But also socks. And I'm, and, so, I'm and a weird, I don't re-wear socks. Oh, gosh. No. <laughs> That's like a no-no for me. No. No. Once they've been on, Socks, they're off. underwear, and for me, shirts. I can't re-wear a shirt. Yeah. I, I mean, is it is it bad if I say I use the smell test sometimes? No, because I probably take it too far. Like, if I even try on a shirt and wear it for more than, like, just a try on, I'm going to have a hard time not putting it in the hamper. I'm very weird. <laughs> Well, you know, in your family, that's not a big deal because you're the one that has to do the laundry. That is true. <laughs> that so, is true. It's my problem. Yeah, it's your problem. You created that I laundry create mountain. That problem, and yeah. I'm fine with it. <laughs> All right. Well, um, if anybody ever meets the two of us, make sure to sniff uh, Cynthia first <laughs> because <laughs> I will be the safe bet. She'll be the safe bet. <laughs> okay, we digress. Let's get back to the Summerton <laughs> man. Goodness gracious. Also in the suitcase was a thread card of Barber brand orange waxed thread of a, quote, unusual type that was not available in Australia. I'm assuming that's like sewing thread? Or... It is like sewing okay. thread. That's okay. exactly what it is. But it's like a, a waxed um, okay. sewing thread. But unusual to find. Unusual to find. And again, not available in Australia. So this is clearly imported okay. from somewhere. Interesting hmm. enough, this thread card this waxed thread really tied the two like the summerton man and the suitcase together i mean the size of pants obviously was an indicator and the fact that it had checked in and checked out but the summerton man's um one of his pants pockets had been repaired with the same unusual oh okay so they're kind of like okay right. this so is it's, definitely it's, his it's like we can assume now that this is his okay yeah so that was a really important find not mm. only is it an unusual thread like sure. to start with um which kind of is more curious mm -hmm. but it definitely ties the two okay cool all identifying marks on all the clothing found in the suitcase had been removed that is so weird yeah so no brand names of any kind so everything had been purposefully removed yes now, they did find some names on some of the clothing, but this is peculiar too. So police found the name T, like the letter T, Keen, spelled K-E-A-N-E, -E, on a tie. They found the name Keen with just K-E-A-N-E, -E, but no T in the beginning, on a laundry bag, and the name Keen. K E A N on a singlet. Now, are you familiar with what a singlet is? No, what's a singlet? Okay, so a singlet is like the old timey, like one piece underwear. Oh, okay. So you know, like what kind of like what wrestlers wear, okay. but like in a white fabric. Okay. So it's like that it has the undershirt and the like boxer yes. or briefs kind yes. of like connected, right? 
Along with these three names, which were again were on like random pieces, okay, uh huh, they found dry cleaning marks. So there were three dry cleaning marks. One was 1171 7, another was 4393 7, and the last was 3053 7. Police believe that whoever removed the clothing tags either overlooked these three items. Or purposely left the keen tags because they knew that wasn't the dead man's name. They definitely don't think it's his name. No, because, because it was left. It would have, yeah, because it would have been identifying information. So the only, the fact that, okay. So they weren't immediately, even though they saw these names, they were like, yes, this is probably his name. They were like, this is already so unusual. These are probably not mm-hmm. his name, but maybe we could try to find. Right. Maybe he's connected to someone named Keen. Right. That can identify him. So they tried to look. Okay. They looked up the name Keen. And they also tried to match these dry cleaning marks to try to find out where sure. those came from. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Hmm. The name Keen did not match any missing persons report. It didn't match any travel reports. They couldn't find anything connected to the name Keen. And they couldn't find any dry cleaner that used these marks. So it all came up dead end. Okay. With initial leads yielding no results, detectives hoped the autopsy would yield clues as to the man's identity. At the Royal Adelaide Hospital, it was estimated that time of death was no earlier than 2 a.m. So sure enough, the folks that had seen him before, he was definitely, like, dying in the process of dying. He died early in the morning, and then the boys riding the horses found him just a few hours after that. Okay. It was determined that the body had not been moved after death. Okay. Which, again, is kind of what eyewitnesses said, sure. but confirmed. He was there. He died there. He was found there. The man was found to be in top physical condition with athletic legs, and he seemed to be in his 40s or 50s. He was 5 foot 11 inches tall with gray eyes, fair to ginger colored hair, slightly gray at the temples, with broad shoulders and a narrow waist. His forearms were tanned, and his big and little toes met in a wedge shape. So are you picturing that in your mind? So literally, let's like, okay, his so big toe he, was pointed towards the middle of his foot, and okay. his little toe was pointed towards the middle of his foot. And all of his toes kind of made like a wedge, like pie shape. Okay, so very distinct feet. Very distinct feet. Okay. And this could be um, attributed to somebody who wore specific shoes like dancers. Okay. Or maybe even certain boots. I have like pointed toes. Oh, okay. All so right. I think, okay, maybe he uses a specific type of, of footwear. Maybe this could help us identify him. Also, he had very pronounced high calf muscles consistent with people who regularly wore boots or shoes with high heels or performed ballet. So he really could. He has several attributes of either a dancer mm-hmm. or a boot wearer, wearer whatever that's, and a boot with a heel. A boot with a heel. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He had on boxer shorts and a men's singlet, a white shirt, a thin red, white, and blue tie. He wore light brown trousers, a brown sweater, and a brown double-breasted coat with, quote, American tailoring. He wore socks, and his shoes were polished, as I mentioned before. He had no hat, which was unusual for the time. Okay. And again, as I said, one of his pants pockets was repaired with this orange thread. A couple of irregularities were also noted in the autopsy. The man's pupils seemed small and unusually shaped. The Somerton man also had blood in his stomach, which suggested to investigators the presence of, quote, some irritant poison. Okay, I was going to say. Yeah, so the plot thickens even more. Yeah. Okay, clearly this wasn't just... A heart attack. Right. Something weird is going on here. Subsequent test found no poison in the man's blood. Oh, really? Yeah. This has led some investigators to believe that the man either digested digitalis or strophanthin, two lethal poisons that don't leave a trace. Mm. The man had died from heart failure, but the reason could not be determined. As in he had no heart disease. His heart definitely stopped. There was blood, they, but they can't figure out what happened. Which you wouldn't, I mean, anything can happen to anybody, but he's he's young. 
he's in great condition, like he's healthy. So for his heart to just stop for no reason is unusual. Yeah. And then the blood in his stomach. So it's clearly something, something irritated his lining. Yeah. And then obviously his pupils. Like, so something yeah. was messing neurologically, right? Sure. Dental and fingerprint records came back with no match. With no additional uh, clues available from the body, detailed photographs were taken and a, quote, death mask was cast before the Somerton man was laid to rest in Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery on June 14th, 1949. The Salvation Army conducted the service and the South Australian Grandstand Bookmakers Association paid for the service to save the man from a pauper's burial. Oh, which I thought was very kind. That is very kind. His gravestone reads, Here lies the unknown man who was found on Somerton Beach, 1st December, 1948. Now, I mentioned the death mask. Yes. Okay. It's just so creepy. It's just so I... creepy, right? <laughs> I know that they're like necessary and all that, but they creep me out. Like, bleh. yeah, the death mask actually becomes pretty important. And I'm rest sure. Of the story. Yeah. So what they did, they had a man come in and cast the Somerton man's head, neck and top part of his part of his torso. OK, so they essentially have a likeness of his face. Sure. Um, And that was literally they put like plaster mm -hmm. on his face so that he could be identified later because at that point you know, they really they had used several rounds of formaldehyde to try to preserve the body but at that point i mean it, it had been a while they needed to put him to rest sure of um, course of course but interestingly so they have this it's it's a white you can see it online there are pictures of it there's this white death mask okay of the summer okay I will look at the pictures. It is but, yeah. it is a little wild. It was a little wild. Again, having no more leads, they decided to go back and do a more extensive forensic view of his clothes. Okay. So he's in the ground, but they're like, let's give it one more go. Sure. See if we can yeah. What else we got? They found in the Somerton man's uh, pants in the waistband a sewn pocket. Oh. A, like specifically sewn pocket. Like a hidden like a added hidden sewn pocket. pocket. Okay. Which they no one would have found without this very specific forensic review. Okay. Mm. They opened up part of it and found there were contents of it. Now, the contents of it were so jammed in the pocket they usually they actually had to get tweezers to pull it out. When they did, it was a folded piece of paper. That read, Tamam should, which means it's finished or it's ended in Persian. <laughs> so <laughs> weird. <laughs> okay, so this was kind of mind blowing, right? Like, what an yeah, exotic, he just had a weird, weird really sewn into a hidden pocket in his pants. Yeah, bingo. That's right. This man that already is such a mystery. I mean, that's why we use the word clandestine in the beginning. Yeah. Like, you know, this, what? What? So, you know, first of all, when investigators found it, they had no idea what Tamam should even means. I'm telling you sure, now what yeah. it means. So you have a little bit of perspective, but they didn't even know what it meant. Yeah. And they, they couldn't didn't just even, go to Google. No. And they didn't know it was Persian. They had right. no idea. They had no idea what it was. So investigators actually printed it in the newspaper. Okay. Now, because they had been printing all along the way about Somerton Man because they were really hoping somebody would come claim him. Again, they're thinking, He's probably local to the area or somebody knows him because mm -hmm. he's in great shape. And so, again, they reached out through the newspaper with the the it was a picture of the paper with Tom Mom should. And they were asking people to come forward and help identify them, um, you know, identify the words and then identify because it was in a very particular script. Okay. And so they were hoping somebody could identify even the source of it. Mm hmm. A journalist recognized the words and text and directed police to a rare New Zealand edition of the Rubaiyat by Omar Khayyam, a 12th century work of poetry. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Like that's niche. Weirder and weirder. Yeah. Now, Omar Khayyam, who again put all these poems together in the 12th century, was a Persian mathematician and astronomer and a poet who had written the book promoting the philosophy of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. 
Okay. That was the whole theme of the book. Okay. In the 1880s, after the book was translated into English, it became popular with troops during World War I mm-hmm. because of kind of the ominous tone. They would be away sure. from home in these bunkers mm-hmm. and they would read these, you know, poems about life and death. Here's an excerpt. Awake for morning and the bowl of light has flung the stone that puts the stars to flight. And lo, the hunter of the east has caught the sultan's turret and a noose of light. Ooh, yeah, nice. I mean, they really are neat. I see how people would kind of get into this. Yeah. But again, how on earth did this man that died on the beach have this like 12th century work of poetry? Yeah. Yeah. Detective realized the Summerton man's folded piece of paper must have been torn from a page in the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Soon the search was on to find the exact book the page had been torn from. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I love police, like their tenacity in this story. I, I love it. I love it. Unfortunately, their search was totally in vain. Until one day, <gasps> a man comes to the police station with a copy of the book. To the excitement of the police, the last page of the book, the part containing the words Tamam should, had been ripped out. Unfortunately, though, the man who brought the book in claimed he knew nothing about the poems or the Summerton man. In December of the previous year, he reported he had taken a drive with his brother-in-law and parked a few hundred yards away from Summerton Beach. When they returned to the car, his brother-in-law noticed a copy of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam on the floor. Both men had assumed the book belonged to the other. But when national coverage of the Summerton man had begun to circulate, the two men took a closer look at the book and realized it was the one police were looking for. Wow. And it just showed up in their car. That is so wild. I literally just got chills. Me too. I mean, it is like. What are weird? What are the chances? What is their connection? Like, are they anybody? Um, I never found out any connection. And okay, they really thought. Um, so they did go on to microscopically test Mm -hmm. the piece of paper and the book, and Mm -hmm. it was a connection. Wow, it definitely was the book. They think because the man said that he had left. I can't remember what it was. It was either his window was a little down or the door was unlocked. Either way, there would have been easy access for somebody to toss something in his car. And they they just wanted to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, I think it was both. I think the window was slightly ajar and the door was unlocked. So they're thinking maybe Summerton man just tossed the book in. Okay, but why would he do that? Either you want to get rid of it or you want to like fuel the fire. I don't even think number one fits because if you just want to get rid of it, why don't you just throw it in a trash can or on the side of the road or something? Why do you put it in someone's vehicle okay. where it can be found? Yeah. Right? So fuel the fire then. Yeah. Just fuel the like, fire or send some kind of message. Right. Because you don't just make it disappear. I mean, somebody's going to find it. Right. Why put but it in then, a vehicle? R- right. Like you want it to be found, but then like, I mean, it's still. And what are the chances that, first of all, investigators would find this teeny tiny little pocket in your pants. Right. Because the, the fact that they even found this little note is, I mean, that's them taking it to an extra step. Which I would assume that nowadays you would. If you had a teeny tiny, I mean, I'd have to see a photo of this pocket or whatever. But, like, nowadays I would expect that, I mean, because, I mean, they find everything. I would assume they have a lot more technology. Right. So I would assume if I had a hidden pocket sewed somewhere into my clothing and then my body is found, I would certainly hope they would find that I have whatever sewn into my clothing. I would. But I guess I'm saying if this was his ultimate plan, he's he's banking on a lot of things coming together in order for this book to come and for him to be matched to this book that he put in this person's car. But it wouldn't be him, right? Because he's dead. Well, so it could either be him or maybe someone had staged him and the book. Maybe there's another player out there. You know, because, again, he does have poison and we're not sure how he got the poison. Did somebody give him the poison? Did he take the poison? Yeah, but the book was planted before he died. Yes. The book was planted before he died. They just didn't turn it in until after. Exactly. You know, it was the next year because, again, this happened, you know, literally it was like right in like December 1st you know okay and so 
they didn't know it was even relevant right until they months just later. This weird book. Yeah, exactly. And I then, gotcha. Yeah. So whoever put it in the car, put it in the car either the day the summer Summerton man died. Or like within a day. Okay. It. Okay. Like they they put it all together. Okay. It all happened at the same time. Gotcha. I missed that part. No. No. So we're okay. all kind of sweet. So all this happened at the same time. Okay. That's why they're saying there was a chance the Summerton man could have put it in there himself. Okay. Or someone who knows of the Summerton man. Who maybe killed the Summerton man. Yeah. Maybe he put it in the car. Okay. Or they put or it in they. the car. Maybe if there's multiple. Or she. Or she. Yeah. Or who knows? Or, okay. Tell me more. I hope you have more information <laughs> than this because um, I need I, to have some answers. To um, I do, but um, it, it's not going to answer any questions. Oh. Okay. All right. Here we go. Focus then turned to the book itself for clues. Sure. Right? Because they're like, okay, this is maybe the last thing that he touched or someone who touched him touched the book. Like, right. let's figure out if you have any clues. In the back of the book were faint indentations representing five lines of text in capital letters. So, you know, when you like you press on a notepad yeah. and the one under it yeah. has the indentions. So they they figured out what mm -hmm. this is. Again, five lines of text. The second line has been like written through, like scribbled through. OK, crossed out. Yeah. Yeah. Crossed out. And. Strangely enough, it's very similar to the fourth line of text. Mm -hmm. And so they're thinking, okay, well, maybe there was some mess up on the second line and then he redid it on the fourth line. But I'm going to read you what these lines of text say. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Yes, I think. Okay. All in capital letters. Okay. Okay. W-R-G-O-A-B-A-B-D. Second line, M-L-I-A-O-I. There's a strike through. The next line is W T B I M P A N E T P. The next line down is like an asterisk, like a printed asterisk. It's like a star, mm -hmm, but like a star mm -hmm. asterisk. And then you drop down one more line. And this is the one that's similar to the second line that was mm -hmm. struck out M L I A B O A I A Q C. And the final line is I T T. M T S A M S T G A B. Okay, tell me somebody has been able to decipher what this code reads. Hmm. Detectives clearly assumed it was some kind of encrypted code. Sure. Just like you did. Yeah. Like, you're like, well, yes, obviously. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not the English language. Those are not words. <laughs> those are not words. They immediately pass this on to the Naval Intelligence of mm -hmm. Australia, but they'd never seen anything like it. They were like, we have no idea what okay. this is. To this day, it has never been solved. Real? No. Okay, I want to look at it. I'm going to solve it right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's wild. It's what No one has been able to I solve mean, it. Really? There no. are like brilliant people out there who can solve it's it. It's been 70 years. No one has solved it. What if it, it means nothing? What if this person was just literally like, you know what? I'm going to go out, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to have a little fun. He could have been a Looney Tune. Who I'm going to, you know. But again, if you're this guy, you're trusting so many things to fall into place to make this weird web of evidence of things he touched. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to assume that they're going to find the book. Realize it's yours or connected to you somehow. Find that you like like a weird some... inscription in the back. Yeah, I mean, like which I mean, good on them. They did find all this back in the forties. I'm like, telling you, I give the police, like investigators and detectives. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of information on the specific detectives. Mm -hmm. I didn't put them in this episode because it would have just been way too long, sure. and too many details. But I loved reading the detective stories. Because they were really determined to solve what this was. And they did not give up. They overturned every, um, you know, every rock. And they looked in every corner. And they used a lot to their disposal. Like, they used they used the newspaper, but not in a publicity way. They really did say, for we help. were asking for help. Right. And it worked in a lot of these cases. Police also found two unlisted phone numbers. In the relief on the page. So the same page that had this weird code also had two unlisted phone numbers. The first number was a dead end. The second phone number led to a young nurse named Jessica Ellen Joe Thompson, 
who lived on Somerton Beach and lived just a five minute walk from the where the Somerton man was found dead. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Thompson was reluctant to speak to police and simply Hmm. said she didn't know the dead man, why he would have her number or why he would have been close to her home. Several detectives also reported her being evasive and reluctant to talk, leading them to think she knew more than she was admitting to. Okay. After her initial questioning, she requested that the police not keep a permanent record of her name or release her details to third parties as it would be, quote, embarrassing and harmful to her reputation to be linked to such a case, end quote. Okay, there's, I feel like there's more. The police agreed. Okay. They agreed. However, this really hampered the investigation from here on out because the news media, books, and other discussions of the case, Thompson's name was all over the place. Mm -hmm. Like, people used pseudonyms Mm -hmm. for her. Mm -hmm. Um, A very common one was Justin. That was a pseudonym that was made. But with so many different people looking at it from different angles, they were like, wait, is this the same person? Is this a different person? Is this another witness? So it just convoluted it. It really did kind of convolute it. And and maybe she really didn't have anything to do with it. Maybe she really was a private person. She's like, please don't get me in the middle of this, like, circus. I just find that to be odd. I mean, yeah, you would kind of set yourself up to be in the middle of a circus, like this really crazy case and then he has your and if you truly don't know why like if i found out that somebody just died in this weird set of circumstances and they had my cell phone number on them and i truly had no idea where it came from i can understand being like i don't know leave me alone i don't know leave me alone exactly please don't write me down because i'm forever going to be linked to this very bizarre and what if it was some kind of like murder or something like that like i don't want to be linked to that like please don't put me anywhere near that right It's just the way she was acting, though, is weird. And I feel like at least me. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like police know the difference between somebody who genuinely just doesn't want to get involved because of, hey, this guy could have been crazy or somebody could have murdered him or what. And I'm hiding something. They seem to agree that they would take her out. Hmm. So they must have found her at least to be partially trustworthy. However, after all this, they finally convinced her to come in and take a look at that death mask. Oh, yeah. They were like, just come in. Just uh-huh. see it. Just look at it. So she wouldn't even come look at Like, no. How? She, okay. You can't say that you know nothing about it if you don't even go look at the person. Yeah. Now, they had printed him his picture in the paper. But n- no. She was like, she didn't even want to come look at it. She's like, I don't want to look at I don't want it anywhere. Else. Okay. No, but they that, were but that's like, weird. If some dead weird. guy find, has your number, you're going to go look at that mask, right? Because aren't you curious? Like, don't you want to know why this person had your number? Uh, she was not. Okay. <laughs> she was not. That's which a makes weird. me think. Yeah, that's I weird. Know. So she did go in and see it. Okay. She almost fainted upon seeing it. Okay. I mean, I just think this is like. Why? I mean, it's not she his gave, actual face. It's um, she gave yeah. no reason. They said she acted peculiar, peculiarly, and when the like the plastic cast came for her, she the she the plaster cast, not plastic plaster mm-hmm. cast, um, came forward. She she almost fainted there. Okay, because the I mean, we mentioned earlier they're creepy, but mm-hmm. it's not going to make me faint unless I recognize it. Yeah, that. That would be my opinion as well. I mean, if it were him, the actual body, okay, maybe that could, you know, if you're squeamish or mm-hmm. whatever. But, like, a plaster cast? Like, freaky, but not, like... Unless you know them. Unless you know them. So, after a little bit more questioning, oh, okay. after that happened, they're like, mm-hmm. something's weird. Yeah, this is weird. Something's weird. Finally, she did admit... Oh. Oh. <laughs> ...to having gifted a copy of this very rare book the rubaiyat to one of her friends a man named alfred boxel the adulated police clearly were like we need to find this man Mm -hmm. maybe it's the summerton man Mm -hmm. but then alas they find alfred boxel alive and well holding his copy of the rubaiyat so somehow there are two copies of this book now. One that she had 
I got chills again yeah. because this is like, how could this be a coincidence? Right. How could this be a coincidence that she would have this book? That is a, this obscure book. This obscure book. Nobody had. That nobody had. And she's like, I still don't know anything about him. However, I did actually have this book and I gave it to my friend and his friend's like, oh, yep, here I am with the book. Why did she lie about that? I don't know. Or hide that? I don't know. Like, I think that's weird, too. Why not just be like, yeah, totally. I gave. But then he has the book. So there's the whole edition of Thompson to me is is really strange. Yeah. It's just like if it were a movie, it would be like, OK, we just added her. Like, yeah, you just made it too complicated. Kind of you made thing. it too complicated because yeah, it's exactly. like, oh, OK, here we go. Here's the thing that ties them together. Oh, wait, never mind. Nope. Yeah. False. Already... False lead. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So. Inter- so they interviewed Thompson, I mean, to the hilt. Sure. And they interviewed Boxel to the hilt. And they literally couldn't get any more information. It was just a dead end with both of them. None of them would give up anything else. So that, again, kind of wound up being a dead end. Like, it seemed like something that had traction, and then it just fizzled out. For years, investigators just kind of looked to the public to help identify the dead man. They just every now and then would just kind of make it resurface like, hey, anybody know who this dude is? <laughs> um, they did receive dozens of leads over that time um, that promised to identify the Summerton man. People would call up over the years because it was big news in that area. Yeah. And they would call up with, you know, like weird things that happened, like they would have missing family members or citizens who found peculiar items among like deceased relatives belongings. Okay. Like something okay. that's like, yeah, sure. okay, this looks weird. Maybe it's like secret spy mm-hmm. stuff yeah. like the Summerton man. Um, or even like there would be strange unsolved murders and they're like, maybe it's related Connect, to Summerton yeah. man. Maybe it's connected, you know, and maybe that even explained if he did commit suicide, maybe that's why he did, mm-hmm. you know, so there were all these different mm-hmm. angles that they were looking at, but everything ultimately led to a dead end. Right. Understandably, though, theories about the strange man found on the beach started to bubble to the surface. I mean, how can it not? Yeah, everybody's going to have an opinion. Yeah, exactly. The first popular theory was that the Summerton man killed himself after being rejected by Jessica Ellen Thompson. Some have suggested that Thompson, who actually didn't die until 2013. Oh, wow. I mean, she was, I mean, alive until very recently. That maybe the Summerton man had fathered her eldest son and he had come to Adelaide to try to like rekindle oh, like something oh. with her. And she rejected him and he went off to the beach and committed suicide. Okay. That was one and theory. And that could explain why she almost fainted and why he had a copy of her favorite book i'm going off now just like in no my but mind, it's true i mean you kind of i see how that's a theory and it's okay. not a far-fetched one and why she doesn't want to get involved because was she remarried at the time or uh she was married the whole time to she, one man she was she was married she was married yeah okay yeah she so, was married the whole time so if indeed this is she would have been having an affair because she was married, which is why you would lie about it. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. so far, that's my theory. Okay. All right, let's see if you give me a better one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and clearly this also fits into the whole like, okay, so he he's the one that ingested the poison. It was sure. suicide. Like, but it then would explain- why like cut out the stuff of your, like the, the labels and the leaving the weird, maybe the, maybe the note. Oh, maybe he left her a note or something, and that's what the weird, like a it special been, like, code an that only the two of them her. Exactly. But yet they're so smart that only the two of them can ever figure that out. Nobody else in the world can ever <laughs> figure out what that it, is. It is really weird. And but again, if it was going to be suicide, it would have explained maybe that was like his suicide note. Like the Tom I'm should, like it's finished, yeah. it's done. Like sure, that was yeah. like his suicide note. Even though why you would make it so obscure and weird. I maybe it wasn't I'm, meant to be found. Maybe it maybe was it for wasn't, him. Maybe it was for him. Exactly. And her. A rejected. He was rejected from this lover. Yeah. And she's like, no, I want to stay with my husband. Maybe I'm going to go down with this. No. And it's just like my message just to see you and I are the only ones. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I, I still like that. Okay. The second theory and the more provocative theory mm. is that the Summerton man was a spy that knew too much. Okay. His death struck many investigators as highly unusual especially if he was indeed killed by a deadly poison that disappears. That is true. Let's go back to that. If you're just an average Joe, you're, you're, you know, 
adulterous affair, like, you know, you're, you're, it's a scorn lover. Mm -hmm, so you're going off. Mm -hmm. Where do you get these poisons that kill you and leave no trace? Right. Do, do you just get that at the pharmacy? Right. 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 And why? Why not? Just and why? Why? I mean, there are so many other ways. Sure. Like if you want to end it, why would you do it that way? Okay. Unless you want to be poetic or something. I don't know. But it still seems a little bit far-fetched. But uh, if someone was involved in, again, these clandestine operations, yeah. you would have more access to some of these materials. Sure. Okay. Okay. Also supporting this theory is the fact that no one came to claim the body despite mm -hmm. publicity around the case. Now, a lot of the th stuff that he had, this thread that we know wasn't available in Australia, the book that just we don't really know where he got that. And then um, the American Calm that mm -hmm. I believe wasn't of it. So did we like did word spread to the Americas? That yeah, this was an international person? case at this point. OK, Ab absolutely. Because he could have had a whole case. family back in America. That's Who's, absolutely like, looking true. for him. But no word spread. It was it literally international publication. Nobody claimed him. That's right. OK. All no right. one claimed him. Yeah. Plus the code. I mean, the code is weird. The code is super weird. Now, maybe it was a special code between he and Thompson. But, but again, they're not unless they're like so. I mean, are they really that smart that like nobody else can crack their code? Yeah. Intelligence AV agencies can't crack the code. Right. Like, yeah, that's a little. Right. And. If. OK, say that was a code meant for her. Mm -hmm. How would she have gotten the code? Because it was in this book that he left in some other person's car. But it wasn't his. Well, that's true. It was a relief. So maybe he tore it off and gave, gave the... her. Yeah. Like the okay, original fine. could be somewhere. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, I get that. I can see that. And I can see even a... I can see like an encoded message. But it's the fact that nobody else can like figure out what it said. Only the two. I mean, because I, I mean, back in high school, me and my secret loves, we wrote secret notes to each other. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure... <laughs> That they write it in indecipherable code. I'm pretty sure the codes could have been cracked. <laughs> I don't even remember the codes. And I'm pretty sure if I found these notes, I'd be like, yeah, uh-huh. I know what this is saying. <laughs> I don't even remember any. Like, I just know that, like, you know. I don't remember the notes being very fanciful, but I do remember my folding technique was on point. I mean, you're going to fold it into a dove. You're going to fold it into a star. You're going to fold it into those tiny little pockets. Yes. So much folding. I was so, an origami whiz. Yes, you were. Now, I couldn't do any of those anymore, but I no. was really good at it at the time. Yeah. yeah. So if you it could figure out how to open it. I mean, it was basically like it was part. basically like the sewn up man's pocket. Right. It was basically how you access my notes. <laughs> You're like, wait, where's where's the entrance to this note? What is this? <laughs> it's hysterical. Now, something else that kind of fits into the spy theory okay. is that there were two sites relatively close to Adelaide that were of specific interest to spies. One oh. was the Radium Hill uranium mine, and the other was the Woodmera Test Range, which is an Anglo-Australian military research facility. The man's death also coincided with a reorganization of the Australian Security Agency, which would culminate the following year with the founding of the Australian Security Intelligence Organization. This would be followed by a crackdown in Soviet espionage in Australia, which was revealed by intercepts of Soviet communications over the Verona project. So there were spies that weren't formally known to be spies that are getting found out now. So the idea that he's a spy really could be viable. Yeah. Like it's not just like a fun theory. Yeah. I mean, it it's absolutely possible. Uh, there was activity. What if he was a spy who also had an affair? Well, you know, my husband's theory uh -huh. is that she was also a spy. Ooh, I just got chills. Ooh. Yeah, but she was also a spy. So you, so he thinks that they actually were like in cahoots. They actually did know each other. Yeah, and his, and he took it even further. He thinks Boxel's in on it too. He thinks the the one that Boxel had was like the 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 code. It was like the cipher. Mm, I got chills again. Yes. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Weird, right? So, but of course, he listens to spy novels like <laughs> it's like audiobooks. And so that's where his mind goes. But that's immediately he because literally I said, and Boxel had it. And he was like, Well, it was the cipher. 
Like to him, it was like, like well, obviously. And I'm like, what do you mean this case what? is unsolved? <laughs> he was really like that. Like, well, duh. Did anybody look at his copy? And I'm like, I don't know. And he was like, well, that's clearly, that's clearly how you solve the code. I love like, it. I can literally see this conversation <laughs> playing out. I can see him. Like to be like, like uh, uh, are you actually making this a podcast? I've clearly figured it out. Like, well, I was like, hey, let me see. After this, I want to look at this code because I'm going to crack this code. I can figure out this code. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? With I Bart- love our faith. Oh, yeah, with Barton and Cynthia on the job. I mean, I'm just here to report their findings. Right. <laughs> and we will solve it for you. <laughs> Bring us all of the unsolved cases and with, between his spy knowledge and yes. my amazing code cracking skills. Exactly. And I will fold it into a... a you know what? Maybe I'll do something different. I'll do like a like a bunny, an origami bunny a, or something. Yes. Yeah. No one will suspect. No one will suspect. We <laughs> cracked it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Now we're gonna fast forward all the way to 2009. Okay. I mean, so we're like 60 years. Yeah. Basically. 60 years. Yeah. No more information. It's Nothing crazy. else happened. 60 years after the Somerton man was found dead on the beach. The University of Adelaide team, led by Professor Derek Abbott, began an attempt to solve the case through cracking the code and proposing to exhume the body to test for DNA. Ooh, oh, yes, because yes. we have DNA now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So now we're in modern times research. Yeah. Right. So I give, you know, 1948, 1949, I mean, they Australian. Did really police, well. They did really well for what they were able to do. Yeah. But now there's this guy and he basically has just made it his life's mission. Sure. This because he's just like, I just am obsessed with it. I have to know who this man is. So he puts together this team and is like, we're going to figure this out. So he starts putting all these plans in place to try to, again, extract DNA, to try to crack the code, like to just bring, put everything in a new light. Yeah, sure. Like, let's look sure. at it with fresh eyes, right? His investigations have led to questions concerning the assumptions police had made in the case. Mm. Unfortunately, he found, oh, this breaks my heart, the briefcase, the autopsy report, detective notes, and all eyewitness testimonies to have either disappeared or been destroyed over the past decades. They don't exist anymore. That's like everything. It's a lot of it. That's everything. It's a lot of it. It sure is. It sure is. It's like all the evidence. <laughs> well, it, it's it's a good it's a good amount of it. That's for sure. Fortunately, he found the death mask. Okay. Thank okay. goodness we have the death mask. <laughs> but again, when you've lost all this, I mean, that seems right. very valuable, right? Sure. You because you've lost the reports, you've lost exactly. the autopsy. You've lost- so he has the death mask and those photos that were taken. Those very detailed photos taken of the Summerton man. Okay. Um, after. But, you know, right before he was buried. Sure. So we have details photos and we have the death mask. A closer look at these photos revealed interesting details. Mm. The image of Summerton Man's ear revealed okay, his Simba, which is the upper ear hollow. So, you know, you have like your ear canal mm-hmm. and then you have like this indention around yeah. your ear canal, right? Mm-hmm. So the top part is called the Simba. Okay. So his Simba was larger than his cavum, which is the lower portion okay. of your ear canal. Now, if you think about an ear, the the upper part is normally smaller than the lower part. So okay. the, the the lower part is like we're, the part we're where your actual is right now, so we can't see each other's ears. <laughs> <laughs> but but where the ear canal actually comes out, yes. that bigger portion, right? Yeah. But then you know, if you're using like a Q tip, like you have that upper little upper portion, that little floop, like yeah. at the top, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's small. And uh-huh. then you have a bigger portion where your ear canal is. Yeah. Okay. His was flipped. So where his ear canal is was actually a little flip, but then the upper portion was bigger. Okay. You kind of picturing it in your mind a little I think bit. So it's yeah. a very distinguishing feature. Yeah. And you can yeah. go look his at ear was just weird. His ear, <laughs> yeah, his ear was weird. <laughs> but this is a known like genetic Thing. feature. Okay. It's a known genetic feature. And only one to two percent of the Caucasian population hmm. have this genetic feature. Okay, so it's it wasn't just like some ab- anomaly related to him. It's a genetic trait. So here we are again, trying to genetically link him. You know, DNA, d- genetics, those kinds of things. 
Abbott also consulted with dental experts who concluded that the Somerton man had something called hypodontia. Hmm. It's a rare genetic disorder where spe- specific teeth never grow. And he had this in both of his lateral incisors. This is also a very rare feature, only present in 2% of the general population. Okay. So by combining these two things, I mean, they found the chances of both these things being present in one person is about 10 million to 20 million, like one in 20 million. Wow. That like somebody would have both of these. Okay. That's how often you would find it. Like for one person out of 20 million would have these. Okay. In June of 2010, Abbott, going on one of the theories, obtained a photograph of Jessica Thompson's eldest son, (gasps) Ron. I I get the chills. It clearly showed that he, like the unknown man, had a larger Simba than a cavum and had hypodontia. Both. He had both. I'm getting chills. Ugh. Like full body chills. Yeah, me too. Me yeah. too. Oh okay. my gosh. Look, you can see him. <gasps> yeah. And again, the odds of that, how could both people share this? I mean, it is possible. It but is possible. Whoa. But whoa. Especially with the way she's sorry, I'm getting so excited. I'm like hitting things right now. <laughs> um, especially with how she's already related to this case. And that's been a theory for so long. Yes. But no one has ever found anything to found link, back anything it up. To link them besides just theory yeah conjecture right oh my gosh now so he's like this is it so they should be able to test that boy's dna that man's dna with summerton man's dna they should be able to test exactly okay so abbott was like let me have him so mm-hmm. his name is robin the okay. eldest son he's like let me at robin yeah i'm going to dna robin says no him. robin had passed away and been buried months earlier Oh, well, that's really sad. But can't they exhume him? <laughs> We're exhuming Summerton, man. Well, you got to get permission. <gasps> and she's not going to get it. And no. maybe would, like, if I were his wife, like, couldn't they get it from something? Okay, so here's what they did. Okay. They did the next best thing. Abbott went to Rachel, who is Robin's daughter, mm-hmm. and said, listen. Yeah. I think you're connected to this case. Sure. And she said, absolutely, we're connected to this case. And she showed him a picture of the Somerton man hanging in their home. No. (laughs) They had just assumed he was part of the family, even though it had never been linked. Uh, Grandma never bothered to be like, hey, y'all don't tell anybody we know this guy. There's literally a man, a picture of the Somerton man. Okay. So obviously something. So, okay. He could have been a spy and she didn't want to admit that she knew him because she was afraid of what might happen. Or he's baby daddy. Or both. So Rachel provided DNA. Okay. She was like, yeah, I'd love to just right. figure this out. Matches came back to the grandparents of Jessica Thompson's husband, Prosper Thompson. So DNA matched to her husband. So he's not. No. Related. No. At least according to this DNA report. Not related. I mean, here we're like, oh, it's solved. Yeah. But not related by DNA. So he is, his father is his father. His, her <laughs> husband. <laughs> yeah. So, some, so Robin's DNA came back matching Rachel's DNA. They were never able to get okay. Robin's okay. DNA. Rachel's DNA. Rachel's DNA came, came back, back to matching. So it would have been like her grandparents' okay. DNA. But it was linked to Thompson's husband. Okay. So she is yeah. biologically related to Thompson's the man. Husband. Okay. So no genetic link. Like no, no genetic- like so the so oh. one in 20 million. And it's and just a fluke. It's a fluke. And yet we're, I'm ready to like, can you imagine if you're Abbott at this point, Crazy. you're like, what, how can this not be? How can this not be? That's so wild. But he doesn't get deterred. So in 2017, so think of, I mean, this is like eight years yeah. later. Like he's still like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure wow. this out. Abbott discovered, cause he's still like, okay, DNA, he still believes DNA is the way to go. Sure. Like, I mean, which, yeah. yeah. I mean, at this point, why not? They've explored all the other options, yeah. right? <laughs> 
he finds embedded in the death mask hairs that were at the right developmental stage for extracting mm -hmm. DNA. Mm -hmm. While most of the DNA is degraded, mm -hmm. analysts were able to use high definition analysis of the mitochondrial DNA from the hair sample. Mm -hmm. They found that the Somerton man belonged to a group so they can find out like this mitochondrial DNA. And they found that his blood um, is possessed by only 1% of Europeans. Okay. This particular um, setup. However, mitochondrial DNA is only inherited through a maternal yes. line and therefore cannot be used to investigate a hereditary link between Rachel and the Somerton man. Okay. So that would be paternal. Yeah. She did come back to her grandfather. She so is biologically related to Jessica Thompson's husband. Prosper Thompson. Prosper Thompson. Exactly. So, is biologically related to, to Robin's daughter. Yes. Okay. And even though we did find some DNA, some usable DNA from mm -hmm. the death mask, it's unfortunately not able to be connected with Rachel because of the way it's inherited. She would not show a DNA match to him. Okay. Because it would only show like her mother. Mm -hmm. It would only match back to her mother. Okay. That's the only way they could really reach her. That. Now, skip ahead to 2021. Okay. Yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> we're kind of like yeah. up to speed, right? Abbott, after acquiring mounting evidence, was finally able to get the go-ahead to exhume oh, okay. the summer to All right. A year later, mm -hmm. on July 2022, okay. I mean, so we're talking yeah. like a year a ago. A year ago. Yeah. Literally a year ago. He and geneticist and forensic expert Colleen Fitzpatrick proclaimed they had solved most riveting mystery. They claimed that using genealogical data to have identified the Somerton man as Carl Charles Webb. Okay. Colleen Fitzpatrick, who specializes in cold cases, built an extended family tree using DNA. From 4,000 names, the pair narrowed it down to one, Carl Webb. They then tracked down the man's living relatives using their DNA to confirm his identity. Oh. Okay. It's a triangulation from two different, totally distant parts of the family tree, Abbott told the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Of the discovery, he said, it kind of feels like climbing Mount Everest and having that mixture of elation that you're at the top, but also tiredness and exhaustion. Sure. I mean, he's really been fighting the good fight I mean, on this. for decades. Exactly. According to Abbott, Webb was born in 1905 in a suburb of Melbourne. He was the youngest of six siblings and married Dorothy Robertson, known as Doff Webb. We have evidence that he had separated from his wife and that she had moved to South Australia. So possibly he had come to track her down. Okay. The marriage was not a harmonious one, largely due to Carl's personality. Dorothy described Carl as solitary, having few friends, living a quiet life, and being in bed by 7 p.m. each night. He was also moody, violent, and threatening, especially when facing defeat over relatively trivial matters. Mm. So he kind of sounds like... Wah, wah. Yeah, a little scary. <laughs> yeah. He was fond of poetry. Okay, that checks. And wrote several poems on his own. Mm -hmm. Most of them on the subject of death. Okay. Which he claimed to be his greatest desire. Okay, so he's a weirdo. He's a weirdo. This would be consistent with mm -hmm. the copy of the Rubaiyat, yeah. which also focuses on the subject of death. Sure. Carl's older sister, Frida Grace, was married to Thompson Gerald Keene. <gasps> they had a son named John who died in World War II in 1943. This would explain why the Somerton man was wearing clothes of American origin and with the name Keene on them. However, officials in South Australia who are still investigating, declined to comment on Abbott's findings and have not endorsed them. Hmm. We look forward to the outcome of further DNA work to confirm the identification, which will ultimately be determined by the coroner, the statement says. Retired Adelaide detective Jerry Filtis, who worked on the case for many years, 
is also waiting on those results before accepting the findings of Professor Abbott and Colleen Fitzpatrick. I'm not going to say I believe it until such time as police results and the forensic results that are done at the autopsy come back and confirm it, which I think they possibly will. Forensic scientist and criminologist Zancy Mallet is also cautious about accepting Professor Abbott's results. I'm not sure we'll ever be absolutely certain, she said. What we would do in a forensic context normally is to take deceased DNA and compare that directly with something with something we knew belonged to them, like a toothbrush or a hairbrush. We haven't got that here. Right. So my concern is that we may never be able to categorically say that we know this person's identity. There's also the complicated factor of while they were ex- able to exhume the body, because they preserved it for so long, trying to have people identify him, they gave him like six rounds of formaldehyde, which greatly oh. disintegrated the body. Sure. Yeah. So here's my thing. Mm-hmm. They say it's true, but it's been over a year and mm-hmm. it's still not been confirmed by right. any independent source. Mm-hmm. And Abbott really wanted to solve this case. Sure. He found someone that fit. Mm -hmm. My question is, though, if he came there, if Carl Webb was really the guy, Mm -hmm. why was he in Somerton Beach? Like, why did he pick there? Why did he decide to die by suicide? I mean, I guess because he was just fascinated with death. Where did he get this poison to kill himself? Or maybe he didn't even kill himself. Maybe he was murdered. We still don't know. We still don't know if he ingested it on his own or if he was given it. And what is his connection to Thompson then? And why all the other just little weird things? What did the code mean? Right. Why the secret pocket? Why the... You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, I guess you could... An odd person. When I said he's a weirdo earlier, I mean, it probably sounded judgmental, but like, I actually use that as like a a compliment a lot of times. Like, maybe he's just kind of an interesting person. Very into the very macabre, into yeah. the mysterious, and he wanted to make it a mysterious thing. Right. Um, it still doesn't ring true for me, though. I feel like there are still so many strange things. So here's my takeaway. Okay. I think he may certainly be Carl Charles Webb. Okay. But I think there's more to Carl Charles Webb than we know. Has to be. Because there is still that connection. Something like the weird. Book, two copies of the book. Like, yeah, the, her fainting. I feel fainting. like maybe that was who he was. Mm-hmm. But I think there's a possibility maybe he was living a double life. Sure. Absolutely. Maybe he was really had a spy nature, but he also was maybe depressed and suicidal and those kinds of things. You could be both. You could be both. But I just think there's there's too much here Mm -hmm. to have it be just a layman who somehow come came up with these very complicated codes and things um they've tried to explain away the codes by saying carl liked to bet on horses okay and this was somehow his own code for horse betting but that does not make sense to me i mean i wouldn't even know what a horse betting code looks like but it was like it was like it was his code on how to know who to bet on like when he got up to like bet but it it doesn't fit to me again i mean i'm not going to argue with dna again if it's confirmed which it hasn't been i mean i'm going to wait for that for sure right and and again i don't think abbott is intentionally trying to lie but again i do think it's important to look for a third party you know authentic authentication authentication (laughs) authentication there we are um but even if it does cap came back to be him i think there's more to the story yeah there's too many other weird things the unless he's just a complete like i don't know i guess there are some people who would just cut all the all the labels out of their clothing and like i guess there's some people who just do weird things because that's it's their explained weird thing. away because at that time so this is post world war ii mm-hmm. and clothing was not readily available sure and so secondhand clothing was a big okay. deal yeah and so a lot of people apparently did this um because you know you would cut out 
other people's like names. But again, that just the yeah, little but, ways to explain things away. I just don't. I don't know. This just doesn't cut it for me. Well, and I guess this was before. Like now, we have brand. Like our, the labels on our clothing are literally the brands. Oh, clothing. these had brand names on them too. The labels. So had why brand cut names. that out? Mm-hmm. Again, like I, I can understand if like it was somebody else's name because it used to belong to someone else. Why you might cut that out, right? But why remove like I don't know the brand name? So if it does come back to be him, which it may. I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying this guy's a liar. I sure, mean, it yeah. May, but you just think there's more. It doesn't answer all of the it questions. It doesn't answer the questions for me. No, I still doesn't. think even if we find out, okay, by DNA, this was him. Mm-hmm. It still doesn't answer the questions for me of how he wound up there, why he was there, no. what the code means. It's just, it's too much. And and what is Thompson's involvement? Because she's got to have some. She has to have some. I just believe that. And and, and, and it is very weird that like her son... Isn't that has weird? Those weird genetic things. How is that possible? And they had a picture of him hanging in their home. Yeah, yeah. No, right? there's more. There's more. There's more. There's more. There's there's totally more. And again, maybe she was just a fellow spy or something. I yeah, don't know. yeah. That could be it. It could be. You but know. there's more to it. So yeah. we we may All actually right. say, okay, he was he was you know Carl Webb. You know, we're we're shaking our hands. Like we've done it. We've solved it. But to me, I feel like that's just the start. Yeah. We know who he is now, but the we don't know the why. Yes. All right. Well, that's a good case, Stephanie. Oh, it's one of my absolute favorites. I yeah. think I literally got like six set of chills just uh-huh. preventing it. And I've I've literally been studying this case for right. weeks now. Ooh, so okay. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, well Join us next week as we bring you more thrills and chills. <laughs> We're going to get Cynthia a coffee. <laughs> or six. Or six. <laughs> Thanks for joining us at the Dark Oak, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. This has been a Just Us Gals production with artwork by Justice Holmes and music by Ryan Creek.